Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. Watching Israel is like watching God's time clock. So goes Jerusalem, so goes the world. So it's hugely important to always keep your eyes on Israel in these last days. Dave Reagan, who is one incredible Bible teacher, uses only a fraction of the 800 plus Jerusalem verses in the Bible to show what's dead ahead on God's prophetic timetable. Oh, wow. Enjoy Jerusalem and Bible Prophecy by Dave Reagan. Well, let me just share a few signs with you. I, uh, I love the ones that are direct and to the point, like this one. Time is short, hell is hot, the king is coming, ready or not. <laughs> or this one, heaven is real, hell is hot, Muhammad is dead, Jesus is not. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then there are the ones that are just, I just read them, I don't write them. What happens in Vegas is forgiven here. <laughs> My all-time favorite signs are the ones that have Churches with strange names. The Baptists are the ones with the best imagination here, but other churches too. Really strange names. Like, for example, the Sleeper United Methodist Church. <laughs> now, I've known churches like that, but they didn't advertise it. I mean, it just... And then, a few years ago, I was driving home from a meeting. My wife was with me, and we were right outside of Dallas near uh, Greenville, Texas. And I suddenly slammed on the brakes, and she said, what are you doing? I said, i got to back up and photograph a sign I just saw. And the sign was this one. It had an arrow pointing down a gravel road, and at the top it said, a warm country welcome awaits you at, are you ready now? The non-denominational battle axe church. <laughs> I've known some of those too, but they didn't advertise it. Churches that just fought all the time, you know. A battle axe church. What? <laughs> well, how about this one? The Hurricane First Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> but I love what they had on their sign. Jesus is more precious than silver or golf. <laughs> Might be some golfers who would argue about that. But Well, I want to talk to you about Jerusalem in Bible prophecy. Father, once again, I want to pause to thank you for the way you have been blessing us with these presentations, the way you've blessed us in fellowship. And Lord, I thank you for Compass Ministries. I thank you for laying the vision of it on Bill's heart so many years ago. I thank you for the way you've blessed these conferences over the years, and I pray that you will continue to do so. I pray that you will keep Bill and his precious wife in excellent health right up until the very day of the rapture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am excited about this topic because I'm going to be talking to you about a city that I love with all my heart. I have had the privilege of going to Jerusalem 45 times, and each time I have been greatly blessed. More important than that, though, is the fact that God loves this city more than any other city on planet Earth. When it comes to cities, not people, but cities, he has preferences, and this is it. He attests to this throughout the Scriptures, how much he loves this city. Take, for example, Jeremiah 6.6. 6. I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. During 1995 and 96, the state of Israel celebrated the 3,000th anniversary of the conquest of the city of Jerusalem by David. There is no other city on the face of the earth as important as Jerusalem. All the other great cities of the world, whether it be New York, London, Moscow, Paris, or even Rome, they all pale by comparison to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is described in the Scriptures as the city of God. Here's how it's put in Psalm 48. Great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great King. As these verses indicate, God has a special love for Jerusalem, and guess what? The Bible says He intends to live there eternally. Psalm 68, why do you look with envy, O mountains, with many peaks at the mountain, Mount Zion, which God has desired for His abode? Surely Yahweh will live there forever. This intention of God is confirmed in Psalm 132, for Yahweh has chosen Zion. 
He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, and I have desired it. And when you read these kind of statements, you can understand why in the book of Ezekiel he says that Jerusalem is at the center of the nations. And further, we read in Ezekiel that Jerusalem is at the center of the world. And I know from personal experience that when you stand on the Mount of Olives, and you look out over that city, you can sense in your spirit that you are standing at the focal point of the cosmic battle between God and Satan. Think of it. Jerusalem is where the Son of God shed His blood for the sins of mankind. Jerusalem is where He will return to be crowned the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jerusalem is the city from which He will reign over all the nations of the world. And the new Jerusalem is where God Himself will come to reside eternally with you and me, with the redeemed. It is no wonder that Jerusalem has always been an important topic in Bible prophecy. But before we look at Jerusalem in Bible prophecy, let's just briefly remind ourselves of the history of this city. The very first mention of Jerusalem in the Bible is probably found in Genesis 14, verse 18, where we are told that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Now, we cannot know for certain that this is a reference to Jerusalem. It seems likely because Abraham was in the area of Jerusalem, and Salem is the root word of the city's later name, Jerusalem. This was about 2,000 years before the time of Jesus. Later, we are told that Abraham went to Mount Moriah and just north of this ancient city of Jerusalem, and there he offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Now that mountain, Mount Moriah, was later incorporated into the city of Jerusalem, and that mountain where he offered Isaac became the Temple Mount where the temples were located. The first mention of the city in the Bible as Jerusalem is found in Joshua 10 and verse 1, where we are told that the city's king, Adonai Zedek, led a coalition of kings against Joshua, and they were defeated in the famous battle of the Valley of Ayalon, where the sun stood still. After the death of Joshua, we are told that the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. But the city's Jebusite residents must have retained control of it because it is later referred to in Judges 19.10 as a place called Jebus, and it was still in Jebusite hands two centuries later when David conquered the city. Here's how it's described in 2 Samuel 5. Now the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, and David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Where we stand now, that's about 3,000 years ago. And now with that brief historical introduction, let's look at Jerusalem in prophecy. The Bible's prophetic passages concerning Jerusalem divide into five categories. Jewish Jerusalem, before the time of Jesus, Gentile Jerusalem, end time Jerusalem, millennial Jerusalem, and eternal Jerusalem. Let's begin with the first category, and that is Jewish Jerusalem. Again, this first set of prophecies relating to Jerusalem are those that pertain to the Jewish capital before the time of Jesus. As you know, the kingdom of David and Solomon split after the death of Solomon. And the northern nation, called Israel, became totally apostate, given over to idolatry. In the 200-year history of that nation, there was not one single king, not one, who was considered righteous in the eyes of God. It was a nation in rebellion from the moment it was born. In contrast, the southern nation of Judah was blessed with many righteous kings. It was also blessed with Jerusalem as its capital. And it was blessed even more by having the Shekinah glory of God residing in its temple there in Jerusalem. But despite all these blessings, the people of Judah became proud and began to drift from their relationship with God, and they began to give themselves over to idols. As the nation began to turn its back on God, the Lord very mercifully raised up prophets to warn the people that they needed to repent or God would pour out His wrath on them. And when they refused to repent, the prophets prophesied that the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed and the nation would be taken into captivity. 
And so we come to the first series of prophecies about this nation. The first prophecy of impending disaster was delivered by the prophet Micah 140 years before the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. Here's what he wrote. Micah 3, verse 11. The leaders of Judah pronounced judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price, and her prophets divine for money. In other words, the nation is shot through with bribery and immorality. Therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become a high places of a forest. Wow, 100 years later, Jeremiah also warned that Jerusalem would be destroyed. Speaking for the Lord, he said, I will do to the house which is called by my name, the temple, in which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and your fathers, Mount Zion. I will do to it as I did to Shiloh, which he had destroyed. Later he became more explicit. In Jeremiah 9, 11, he said, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins and a haunt of jackals. And the people simply refused to believe Jeremiah. They considered him to be a traitor, and they decided to kill him. And they were going to kill him. But the Jewish elders suddenly reminded them of something. The Jewish elders reminded them of Micah's prophecy. Interesting. Jeremiah 26. Then some of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become ruins. And did Hezekiah put him to death? This persuaded the people. They did not kill him, although they threw him in a pit and he almost died there. But he was saved. But the people refused to repent and the prophecies were fulfilled in 587 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar put the city under siege and ultimately destroyed both the city and its temple just as the prophets said would happen. This great uh, uh, tragedy produced one of the saddest couple of verses that you will find anywhere in the Old Testament, verses that apply overwhelmingly to America today, as I show in my book, the, uh, uh, um, uh, God's Prophets to America. Here are the two verses. You can almost hear God weeping in these verses. And Yahweh, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by His messengers, the prophets, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place, but they continually mocked the messengers, the prophets. They despised His words. They scoffed at His prophets until the wrath of Yahweh rose against His people until there was no remedy. God always warns before He pours out His wrath. He warned them. He's warning our nation today. After 70 years of captivity in Babylon, God, in His grace and mercy, allowed the Jews to return to their homeland, and thus we come to the prophecies concerning the Gentile Jerusalem. They returned back home, but they refused to receive their Messiah. And so the Lord gave a second group of prophecies relating to a period of time when Jerusalem would fall under Gentile control. Jesus Himself delivered these prophecies in the last week of His life as He taught His disciples on the Mount of Olives. Here's what he said, Luke 21. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, because these are days of vengeance, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations. This prophecy was fulfilled 40 years later in 70 A.D. when the Romans under Titus destroyed the city and destroyed the temple. But notice... Jesus gave another prophecy about the city, a very interesting one. He said, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now watch what happened after that. First, the Romans. The Romans were followed by the Byzantines. The Byzantines were followed by the Muslims. The Muslims were followed by the Crusaders. The Crusaders were followed by the Mamluks. The Mamluks by the Turks for 400 years. The Turks were followed by the British. The British were followed by the Jordanians. And then on June the 7th, 1967, the Jews regained the city of Jerusalem for the first time in 1,897 years. And what did Jesus say? Watch the city of Jerusalem. When it ceases to be under Gentile control, you will know that I am about to return. On that day, Rabbi Shlomo Goran, 
the chief rabbi of the Israeli army, and later the chief rabbi of Israel, went to the Western Wall. He had a Torah scroll under one arm. He had a chauffeur in the other hand. He blew the shofar. When he got the attention of everybody, he said, I proclaim to you the beginning of the Messianic age. And why did he say that? Because he knows the prophecies of the Hebrew prophets that say that when the Jews are back in the land and back in the city, the Messiah is going to come. This brings us to the third group of prophecies about Jerusalem that explain why he said this. And these are the prophecies concerning end-time Jerusalem. This third group are those that relate to the time of Jerusalem right before the return of the Messiah. 400 years before Jesus, the prophet Zechariah, who probably was a teenager, gave a remarkable series of prophecies about events that were going to affect Jerusalem in the end times, right before what we call the second coming. Here's what he had to say about end-time Jerusalem. He wrote, Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it'll be against Judah. And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. And all who lift it will be severely injured. And all the nations of the earth are going to come together against Jerusalem. And then he continues, In that day I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. Let me summarize this prophecy for you. First, it says the Jews are going to be regathered to Israel. Second, the Jews will be returned to the city of Jerusalem. Third, Jerusalem will be the focal point of world politics. Four, all the nations of the world will come against Israel over the issue of Jerusalem. Five, the Israeli army will be like a fire pot among pieces of wood. Very powerful. And all these prophecies have been fulfilled in your lifetime and my lifetime. The Jews are back in the land. May 14, 1948, the Jews are back in the city of Jerusalem, June 7, 1967. Despite the very tiny size of the nation of Israel, only 300 miles long, only 70 miles wide, its military forces are considered to be among the top 10 military forces in the world. And in 1973, Israel became the focal point of world politics during the Yom Kippur War when the Arabs pulled the oil boycott Uh, that inflicted Western nations. You don't have to pause here and say, all those prophecies fulfilled in our lifetime. And the other day I had a man walk up to me and he said, you know, wouldn't it have been exciting to live in Bible times? I said, man, we're there. We're living in Bible times. The sad part is that most people in the church today know nothing about Bible prophecy. They don't even have any idea what exciting times we are living in. Let me just give you one example. It says in the book of Jeremiah two times, two times, that when history is over and done and God is finished with the Jewish people, the history of the world is finished, the Jews will look back on their history and they will no longer swear by the God who delivered them from Egyptian captivity, but they will swear by the God who regathered them from the four corners of the earth. Same God. What that's saying is that when they look back on their history, they will consider their regathering from the four nations, uh, four corners of the world to be a greater miracle than their delivery from Egyptian captivity. And we are the generation that is living to see that with our own eyes. And the average Christian has no idea how important that is or how wonderful it is or how miraculous it is that God preserved them for 2,000 years and now has brought them back into the land. What a miracle of God. Well, In the years that followed the Yom Kippur War, all the nations of the world, including the United States, began turning against Israel, forcing her into a suicidal policy of trading land for peace. The nations also steadfastly refused to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish state, including us. We built this monstrosity, this this, uh, embassy in Tel Aviv. And folks, that was a terrible, terrible affront to the Jewish people. It would be like some nation coming over here and saying, we don't recognize Washington, D.C. as your capital, so we're going to build our embassy in Chicago. And that's what the nations of the world did to the tiny nation of Israel. We can praise God that President Trump, unlike Bill Clinton and George Bush, had... (laughs) Incidentally... I only mentioned two presidents because Obama never promised. 
But both Bill Clinton and George Bush promised when running for president, if you will elect me, I will move the capital to Jerusalem. And both of them reneged on the promise. He made this historical proclamation on December the 6th, 2017. But this is not the end of the matter. Israel is now deeply, listen to me carefully, deeply indebted to Trump. And being the deal maker that he is, you can expect Trump to put incredible pressure on Israel to make major life-threatening concessions to the Palestinians. And if Israel refuses to do so, as they should, Trump's attitude toward Israel, like all previous presidents, could sour very, very quickly. In fact, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but just a couple of weeks ago, in August, the end of August, President Trump made this statement. In the upcoming negotiations with the Palestinians, Israel will have to pay a higher price. The Palestinians will get something very good because it is their turn. Let's see what happens. It's always the pressure on Israel because the Palestinians will not budge. So they always put the pressure on Israel. And I'm hoping that Netanyahu will have the courage to stand up to that pressure. Remember that you have to keep in mind that if the Democrats select, as I'm sure they will in the future, a president as ideologically liberal as Obama was, and they back him up with a Congress, there's no doubt in my mind that the United States will pick up where it left off with Obama and start putting the pressure on Israel once again, and we will join the world in coming together against Israel. Remember, Obama is the one who interfered in the elections of Israel in 2016. Do you remember that? He spent $350,000 of taxpayer money to try to defeat Netanyahu. He sent members of his White House staff. And then we start turning around the Democrats saying, we are upset about the Russians interfering in Ireland. Let me tell you, God will do to you what you do to Israel. You interfere in Israel's election, people are going to interfere in our elections. Obama was the one that did that. Obama is the one who engineered a U.N. resolution condemning Israel's right to any of the so-called occupied territories. In fact, he arranged the whole thing. And Obama conspired behind the back of Israel to make a deal with Israel's number one enemy, Iran, a deal that enabled Iran to continue with their development of nuclear power. And all the while, Obama feigned support for Israel. We can praise God, though, for one thing. We can praise God that Obama bypassed the Senate because he knew he could never get the Senate's approval. So he bypassed the Senate, and instead of making that a treaty, he made it, quote, unquote, a deal. And since it was just a deal and not a treaty, President Trump could just do away with it with a signature of a pen, which he did. Look at that headline. Trump withdraws from Iran, equal to do, isolating himself further from the world. Well, let him isolate himself from the world. We don't need the world. We need people who will stand for God's Word and for the nation of Israel. Well, let me say that probably we're facing a, an administration down the line that is going to, no, not probably, we are, that's going to turn against Israel. And the groundwork for that reversal of our nation's policy is already being laid in the BDS movement, the boycott divestment uh, uh, movement where they're trying to get churches and, and corporations to divest themselves of any stock in Israel. And churches all across America are doing that. And look at that, apartheid. That's what they're using. They're saying Israel is an apartheid nation. Israel is not an apartheid nation. There is no apartheid in Israel, none whatsoever, none. Apartheid exists in every Arab nation in the world where they were not allowed Jew to live. But in Israel, you've got 1.8 million Palestinians who are citizens of Israel who have every freedom and every right in Israel. They can vote in elections. They can get unemployment insurance. They, they can ride on the same transportation. This is a lie from the pit of hell. It's the old Joseph, uh, Goebbels concept that if you tell a lie big enough and often enough, people will buy it. And that's what the world has done. They've bought that when there is no apartheid whatsoever. Well, we can praise God for the fact that these were not the only end-time prophecies of Zechariah. Let's pick up where we left off, Zechariah 12. In that day, the end times, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of Yahweh before them. In other words, they're going to be, this little tiny nation is going to be like David against Goliath in the end times. I wish I had 
put this in here, that my favorite cartoon about Israel. It shows the leaders of the nation, a tug of war between Israel and the leaders of the, nation of the wor- nations of the world. And all the major leaders of the nation of the world are on one end of the rope pulling with all their strength. And one person, Netanyahu, standing on the other end. And they're ne- making no progress at all because the rope goes out behind him on the ground and there's a big finger from heaven on that end of the rope. Yeah. Yeah. So it will come about on that day that I will, uh, uh, let's see, in that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants. It will come about on that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come together against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David. Oh my, this is, not only is God going to defend them, but look what else he's going to do. This is amazing. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look upon me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they'll weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. He is going to bring a great remnant of the Jews to the end of themselves. That is one of the major purposes of the whole tribulation period is to bring the Jewish people to the end of themselves. Throughout the Old Testament, every time they got in trouble, they ran to Egypt. Today they get in trouble, they run the United States. All the nations of the world are going to come against them. And in the tribulation, they're going to have nobody to turn to until they get to the end and come to the end of themselves and they turn their hearts to God. Boy, what a day that will be. And then this, in, uh, this particular uh, verse here, uh, Zech- let's see here. In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. The fountain of the blood of Jesus is going to be opened for them, and a great number of them are going to come into the kingdom. It says in that day, uh, this is also affirmed in Isaiah 10 and also in Romans chapter 9. And so, he says, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be captured. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west. And then it concludes by, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name the only one. And all I could say was hallelujah. The day is coming when Jesus is going to reign. Well, verse 9 brings us into the fourth category, prophecies concerning millennial Jerusalem. I love this picture. I don't know how clearly you can see it, but it's a great painting of the millennium. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, the greatest earthquakes in history will occur, every mountain lowered, every valley lifted up. And it says the city of Jerusalem will be lifted up and implies it will be the highest point on planet earth. So he shows Jerusalem lifted up. He shows the radiance of Jesus coming out from Jerusalem. He shows millions of people going to Jerusalem to see the Son of God. Of course, at the Feast of Tabernacles, we're told that all the nations of the world will be sending uh, representatives. And in the foreground, we see the, the swords being beaten in the plowshares and the wolf with the, with the lamb and, and the little boy playing with the snake. Almost every day we have somebody call us and say, I know that somewhere in the Bible it says, the lion will lie down with the lamb, and your ministry is named Lamb and Lion, and I can't fight it, so where is it? It's not there, folks. The Bible never says that the lion will lie down with the lamb. It will, but it doesn't say that. It says the lamb will lie down with the wolf. I guess it's just more dramatic to put the lion with the lamb, and that's what's on the Christmas cards, but it's going to be the wolf with the lamb. And so we have to explain to them that the name of our ministry is not based upon that verse The name of our ministry comes from the fact that the two great prophetic images of the Messiah that is presented in the Hebrew Scriptures are the suffering lamb and the conquering lion. He came the first time as a suffering lamb. He's going to return as a conquering lion because he's going to roar from the heavens and pour out the wrath of God upon those who have thumbed their nose at God. Okay, let's take a look now at the prophecies concerning millennial Jerusalem. What a glorious day this is going to be. So here we go, Micah chapter 4. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord, that's the kingdom of the Lord, will be raised up above the hills, the nations, and the peoples will stream to it. And many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. They will hammer their swords and the plowshares, their spears and the pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword 
against nation. Never again will they train for war. And each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid. For Yahweh of hosts has spoken in that day, declares Yahweh, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. Referring, of course, to the Jewish people. This prophecy tells us that during the worldwide reign of Jesus, it's going to be something else. Look at this. I will make a lame, a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. What a day it's going to be. What a day. It says that Jerusalem is going to be the center of the world during the millennial reign of Jesus. It's going to be the political, economic, and religious capital of the world. And it's going to be a very different Jerusalem from what we know today. The great worldwide earthquake that will occur is going to change the topography of Jerusalem. And the Bible indicates it's going to be greatly expanded in area and lifted up higher, perhaps becoming the highest point on earth. The city will be greatly enlarged and beautified. And the most magnificent temple in all of history will be built under the personal supervision of the Messiah. We have two future temples to go. The temple that will be built at the beginning of the tribulation and then the temple that the Messiah himself will supervise in his building. That temple is described in detail in Ezekiel 40 through 48. The glory of Jerusalem in those days is best summed up by Isaiah in Isaiah 62. Listen to what he has to say. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not keep quiet. He says, until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. And the nations will see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name which the mouth of Yahweh will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said of you forsaken, nor to your land will it in it no longer be said desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land will be called Beulah land, which means married to God. For the lo- Yahweh delights in you, and to him your land will be married. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen all day and all night, and they will never keep silent. You who remind Yahweh, take no rest for yourselves, and give him no rest until he a establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Think of that, Jerusalem becoming a praise in the earth. For the first time in its long, bloody history, it will be a city of peace, and it will be the greatest wonder on earth, containing the glorious millennial temple that will house the Prince of Peace. And incredibly, serving as home once more to the Shekinah glory of God. Isaiah 4 puts it this way. In that day, the branch of the Lord, the Messiah, will be beautiful and glorious. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone is recorded for life in Jerusalem. Then Yahweh will creed over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies, a cloud by day, even smoke, the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a a canopy, speaking of the Shekinah. And there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Zechariah says that the nations of the world will send delegations to Jerusalem each year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and people will go up to Jerusalem from all over the world. Oh, what a day that will be. And the last verse, the very last verse of Ezekiel tells us the new name of Jerusalem that will be given to it at that time. Today it is Jerusalem. But then it will be Yahweh Shema. That will be the new name of Jerusalem because it means the Lord is there and he will be there in his glorified body reigning over all the earth. Well, those are the prophecies about millennial Jerusalem. We end now with the prophecies concerning eternal Jerusalem. Eternal. Millennial Jerusalem is going to be replaced by a new eternal Jerusalem that Jesus is preparing in heaven right now. The city will serve as the eternal abode for all of us in our glorified bodies, all of us who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. The Apostle John described it in Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. I grew up in the church, never missing a day. 
I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, vacation, Bible school. And I praise God that I grew up in a family like that. I never heard any of this. I was taught that when I died that we were going to become ethereal spirits. Ethereal spirits. And we were going to live eternally in a spirit world called heaven, which was an ethereal uh, place. And, and uh, we had never heard anything about a new earth, a, 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 a glorified body, nothing like that. And you know, <laughs> I have to admit that I'd hear these sermons and i go home. And when I was 12, 15 years old, I'd go home, get in the closet and die laughing. You know why? You won't believe this. I grew up in a church that taught that the worst sin you could possibly commit was to play a musical instrument in a worship service. We thought that all Baptist piano players were going to be put in the deepest, darkest, hottest part of hell, and we rejoiced over it because they shouldn't play those pianos in church. And then our preacher would get up and say, oh, it's going to be glorious. We're going to go to heaven, and we're going to float around in the cloud forever playing a harp. I thought, what? We're going to do what? I'll go to hell if I play one here, but I'm going to play one forever in eternity? It made no sense to me. To me, it was total nonsense. And later on, when I started studying the Word of God, I found out that's exactly what it was. The New Jerusalem. That New Jerusalem is going to be lowered down to earth, and we're going to be inside of it. In fact, I think that at the end of the millennial reign, we're going to be taken off and put in, the, in this New Jerusalem. We're going to witness the greatest fireworks display in history. And then we're going to be delayed, uh, uh, delivered back down to this earth, and uh, the redeemed and our glorified bodies are going to live in the presence of Almighty God who will come down from heaven to live forever with us. And what a great city that's be. It's going to be 1,500-mile cube with 12 foundations made of precious stones, each one of those foundations named after an apostle. Likewise, there'll be 12 pearly gates, one name for each tribe of Israel. The walls will be made of jasper, and the city itself will be pure gold like clear glass. But the best part of the city will not be its beauty. The best part will be the personal presence of Jesus our Lord and Almighty God our Father. He will be there. And Revelation 22 tells us something radical. It says that we will see God's face. The Bible says no one has ever seen the face of God. It says we in our glorified bodies in the new Jerusalem on the new earth will see the face of God. And I tell you what I think that means. I think it means that we will have intimate, personal fellowship with our Creator eternally. And that thought just causes me to stand in awe. Now, as I bring this close, I want to consider several things. I want to consider what is the relevance of all this to a group of Gentiles here in Denver in the beginning of this century. And I know we do have some Messianic Jews here for which I praise God. Here's the first thing. What does all this mean? It means that God is faithful. Just as he fulfilled prophecies about Jerusalem in the past and is fulfilling prophecies about Jerusalem right now, we can be confident that he will fulfill every promise he has made about Jerusalem in the future. There is going to be a millennial Jerusalem. There's going to be an eternal Jerusalem. And we, the redeemed, are going to be richly blessed by both of them. Second, the record of Jerusalem in prophecy means that God is sovereign. He is in control even when everything seems to be out of control. Let me tell you, when I look at the evening news and it looks like everything is out of control, I always think of one thing, Psalm 2. And if you don't know it, learn it. Psalm 2. You know what it says in the Psalm 2? It says that while all of the political leaders of the earth are conspiring against Almighty God, that God sits in the heavens and laughs. He laughs. Not because he's not concerned. He laughs because he has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of his son in history. That's why he laughs. Third, God is calling you and me to live with an eternal perspective. In Hebrews 11, we are told that Abraham lived by faith as an alien in this world, looking for the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. What a verse this is. Look at Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, <coughs> whose architect and builder was God. 
My friends, we are never to get uncomfortable with this world. We're never to get in bed with this world. We are to live with an eternal perspective, and like them, we are to look for that day when that eternal Jerusalem will come. Hebrews 11 and 13 says that all the heroes of the faith listed in that chapter live their lives as strangers and exiles on the earth because they desired the city which God had prepared for them, namely the eternal Jerusalem. And that is the way that we should be living today. Look at that. They lived as strangers and exiles on the earth. Let us, therefore, live as strangers and exiles looking for that city which is to come. That is the way we are to live in this world. There is a fourth reason Jerusalem in prophecy is relevant to us. And that is God has fulfilled every past promise that He has made about Jerusalem and is currently fulfilling the end times one. We as the church can be confident that God is going to fulfill every promise to us. I've talked about promises to the Jews. Let me tell you, God's made a lot of promises to us. And when we see Him fulfilling those promises, we can be absolutely assured He is going to fulfill every promise He has made to us. He has promised that one day soon, Jesus will appear in the heavens. It any moment it, that could happen. There'd be a shout of an archangel, the blowing of a trumpet, and Jesus will appear. He's going to bring with him the spirits of the dead. He's going to resurrect their bodies, put their spirits back together in their bodies, glorify those bodies. And then, best of all, those of us who are alive at that time, we are going to follow them. And on the way up, as we go up to meet him, we are going to be transformed from mortal to immortal. We will not even experience death. We will be translated into glorified bodies on the way up. He's going to take us to heaven. And there in heaven, he is going to judge us of our works, not to determine our eternal salvation, but to determine our degrees of reward. That's why it's so important for you to learn what your spiritual gifts are and to use those gifts to advance the kingdom. He is going to reward us uh, with, with gifts of one kind or another. And during that time, after he finishes that judgment, the tribulation will be poured out upon this earth. We will not be here. And at the end of that, we're going to sit down in heaven at that marriage feast of the Lamb, and we're going to celebrate our union with Jesus Christ. And at the end of that celebration, He's going to stand up and say, let's go. And He is going to break from the heavens on a great white war charger, the symbol of a victorious general. We're going to follow Him, and He's going to replay an event in His life. I believe this with all my heart. He is coming back to the Mount of Olives, and when He arrives there, He's going to arrive on that white war charger, very different from the first time He came, when He came on a donkey in a very humble uh, position. He's coming back as a a mighty warrior. And, and, and we're going to be there. We're going to be there. Hundreds of millions of glorified saints. We will fill the heavens. We will fill the Mount, the, 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 the Kidron Valley. We will be there to say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of God. Every time I sing a song with those words in it, I get goosebumps because I know one day I'm going to be singing it to Jesus as He arrives on that mountain. And then He is going to replay an event in His life. Once before, He rode down on a donkey into that Kidron Valley, and people waved palm leaves and put their, their, their scarves and, and, and the robes on the robe uh, for this man who had raised Lazarus from the dead. And they said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of God. And then a week later, they were shouting, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. And he was humiliated as a common criminal. But God is going to exalt him. He's going to come back and he's going to ride down into that Kidron Valley again. And hundreds of millions of glorified saints are going to be singing hallelujah and hosanna, hosanna. And he's going to ride up to that eastern gate, go home and read Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is all about what's going to happen when he comes up to that eastern gate. It says that gate is going to blow open. It's the only gate of Jerusalem that is closed. It was prophesied that it would be closed. It is closed. It's going to blow open. And the gate says, come on in you son of glory come on in and he's going to go up on that temple mount and while we are shouting and singing he's going to be coronated the king of kings and the lord of lords and he is going to reign in glory and majesty for a thousand years we're going to see the earth flooded with peace righteousness and justice and at the end of that time <coughs> there will be a rebellion on the part of those some of those born during the millennium not us but on the part of some who who you know will, will rebel against him because have you ever thought stop to think what it would be like to live in the millennium in a regular body, and Jesus is ruling with the rod of iron, and every person in a position of authority, everyone, will be in a glorified body. That means if you violate the law, you will be arrested immediately. You will be taken to a judge who's in a glorified body with the mind of Christ. Your trial will be fast. It will be simple. Your sentence will be given. There will be no, no appeal because there will be no appeal. 
Jesus is going to rule with the rod of iron. That's why the earth is going to be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice as the waters cover the sea. But can you imagine living in that with a, with a regular body and that body wanting all the things that the body wants? And you'll be grinding your teeth and saying, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. And at the end of that millennium, God's going to let Satan loose. And he's going to come and say, let's go get the joker in Jerusalem. And those people are going to gather, and they're going to go get Jesus. And it says God will pour out his wrath and destroy them. And God will prove once and for all, you cannot change people by changing their environment. All humanists, all liberals believe if you can just change their environment, if you just take the guy out of the ghetto and get him in a nice, beautiful home in the suburb, everything will change. No. In the ghetto, he'll throw a brick through the window and steal a TV set in the in the. Uh, suburb, he will go to the office, manipulate the computer, and embezzle a million dollars. In the ghetto, he will pay a prostitute $50 to go to bed, but in the suburb, he will be sophisticated. He'll chase his neighbor's wife. You don't change people by changing. The only way you can change anybody is through the Holy Spirit coming within them and changing them. And God's going to prove that once and for all. History goes in a circle. It begins with two people in a perfect environment, and they rebel against God. It ends with all of humanity in a perfect environment. And they rebel against God. That's not the end of it. Because then God's going to take those of us who are saved off this earth, put us in that new Jerusalem. We're going to see that greatest fireworks display in all of history. And then he's going to lower us down to that new earth. And we're going to live in glorified bodies in a new earth on a new Jerusalem in the presence of Almighty God forever and ever and ever. And that's why every morning when I get up, I shout, Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you and God bless you. This has been Jerusalem in Bible Prophecy, presented by Dave Reagan. To receive a free catalog of hundreds of awesome Bible studies on DVD video and audio CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 800-977-2177, 24 hours a day or visit us on the web at compass.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook. Search facebook.com slash compassbible.